that script. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, Wait, he look, went off do, We do have more important things, but obviously I've given this an awful lot of thought. And you can sit and say, okay, now we go and we come back, or we don't go. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's say we go, and we take, you know, you know why seven is a good number? That's all we can get in my Facebook. <laughs> I wish you could get seven people, but it's an odd number, see, when you have a difficult decision. If you have six people, it could be three against three, and you won't make a decision. So you got to have an odd number. That's interesting. That's what the psychologist told us. <laughs> <laughs> right, now, now I'm, I'm I like real that. serious uh, because we can talk about going somewhere and what are the benefits going to be uh, and we can talk about uh, why we, America, should go back to the moon, and why maybe we shouldn't go back to the moon. Um, but let's get to Mars. Now, let's say we got a good sized spacecraft. We've got seven people in there. So, and it's international. But it's going to be led by the United States. <laughs> uh, now, we're going to land seven people on Mars, and they're going to stay until Earth catches up with Mars again, and it's yeah. on the order of a year and a half, and we're going to bring them back. Right? No. Not necessarily. Well, he's been listening to me. I have. I have. <laughs> We're supposed to be. But, but not everyone feels like that. Now, I want to ask you to think about the billions of dollars, not just the United States, but countries around the world have spent to put those seven people on Mars. Okay? We're going to bring them back. I want you to think about what they're going to do when we bring them back to continue to earn the billions of dollars that have been spent on getting them there. And they're not going to get home for nothing. I mean, that is expensive too. Much more than you'd like to know. But what, what are we going to do? Now, you have to realize that on the way back, the second crew has gone. And we're about halfway there when the first crew is about halfway back. So don't get in your mind that that crew coming back is going to help to train the next crew. Because we got professional trainers that trained that first group of seven where they went there. And these professional trainers are going to be watching damn near everything those seven guys do while they're there. Because we want to know what, what is the thing that humans can do over there. Okay, so these are professional trainers. They're going to be the ones who train the second crew, not the guys that come back. <coughs> You know, what else can we do with those seven people? Actually, I, I'm taking a little sidebar here because you brought up an interesting point in, in who's training them. 
when you were going to the moon, how much were you paying attention to what was happening during Apollo 10 before Apollo 11 went? Because it was a dry mm -hmm. run. We stole our Capcom. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. Charlie Dukes was really impressive mm -hmm. uh, on, uh, on Apollo 10. Uh, we, we didn't believe we were those guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we've got to bring it back to the film. Yeah. 2001. Uh, did you allow yourself at the time to, to get into the film? Did you notice any, you know, what was the film like compared to the real First thing? time I saw 2001? Yes. Yeah. It was before we went to the moon. I believe. What was the real thing in comparison? You're not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. I fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> I have to ask this question. Did you fall asleep on the way to the moon? <laughs> looking at the yes, movie. Yes, we did that too. <laughs> so you fell asleep in the movie. Okay, I got it. <laughs> one, 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 I want to pull a meal into this because when we were talking earlier. You know, when, when Stanley Kubrick was beginning production of the film, you know, because these iconic scenes with these classical pieces, Strauss and what have you, uh, you know, I can't hear some of those. Uh, things today and not think of that movie. But at the time, he was actually thinking of scoring, having an original score for it. Exactly. He commissioned uh, the composer who wrote the film music to Cleopatra and to Spartacus, Alex North, to write a whole soundtrack. And Jim wanted a, a new soundtrack for 2001 A Space Odyssey. And while this composer wrote the entire score, he decided right before the premiere to use his score that he put together, classical score. So they opened it. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, but you can, you can find there, somebody has, uh, Jerry Goldsmith has recorded Alex North's score, so you can actually listen to it and see if you think. But it's amazing when you hear that opening fan, the 2001 fanfare, as we know it, by Richard Strauss, it was a totally obscure piece of classical music. This film made it one of the most famous pieces and most identifiable pieces of orchestral music in orchestral music history. Sadly, uh, Alex North only found out that Schubert did not use his score when he went to the premiere. <laughs> so he felt, he felt very bad and very, um, he said it was one of the most humiliating experiences of his life. But I think Kubrick was a little bit of an unusual fellow. <laughs> but what he produced, I mean, this is this, this transcends science fiction, this marriage of imagery, silence, and abstract modern music. He also used the, the abstract music for the, the, the light tunnel, uh, is by a Hungarian composer named Ligeti. And Mr. Ligeti found out that his music is used in 2001 also after the premiere because he didn't ask permission. He just, he just <laughs> but he also made his music very famous because he was an obscure modernist, modern composer. And just the, the genius of what Cooper did in this marriage. And I think it was really, uh, in the dressing room, I was uh, chatting with Buzz, I thought it was just fascinating that... Um, and, I is he still alive, the guy who wrote that? No, he, he died a couple of years ago. But actually it made him very wealthy and very famous. But uh, I, I thought it was cool that in the year 2001 you met Arthur C. Clarke. As a, yeah, yeah as I was a, on a cruise ship. Uh, I spent the whole day in 2001 with Arthur. I was going to do that again in 2004. There was a tsunami. Oh. <laughs> so this is uh, two years ago. Charlie was here uh, right 10 days before the landing of Curiosity on Mars. And we had a short film made by uh, Duncan Cobb that we showed before uh, the planets that we had in association with NASA. And I remember that so clearly. And the, the technology of that looked absolutely uh, crazy. It's like, there's no way this could work. Um, and we had the film in a short uh, shortened version, of course, and animated with music by Bizet, introduced by, by Charlie Bolden, and then I was so fortunate to be at the Jet Propulsion Lab on the evening that it landed successfully. And I think that is speaks loudly, so loudly, for the future of what Americans can do with our advanced technology for exploration and for mankind. And uh, it's such a thrill that you all are here to see this monumental film 
And we've had uh, many associations with NASA over the years. The National Symphony Orchestra, I think, has the closest association with NASA of any orchestra in the country. Yeah, the socks are amazing. If, if any of you think of trying to fall asleep during 2001, just remember Buzz's but, socks. But, <laughs> <laughs> it's, such, it's such an honor to have this man with us on this celebration and for to be a part of it. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to know you appreciate songwriters. Absolutely. <laughs>